Welcome everybody uh, to our session about Proton and Git. Today we're going to be talking uh, a bit about how we're going to use Proton and Git to deliver code and architectures in a collaborative way between platform teams and development teams. I am Rafa Alvarez. I'm a product manager in the Proton team and I'm going to be joined later by David Kilmon, one of our senior developers in the Proton team. Today we're going to be talking about three things. We're going to start speaking a little bit about what Proton is, why we built it, what is the benefit you can get from it, and we'll go through a handful of use cases of actual customers that have been using Proton. We'll then go over some of the new features we're launching this year that are actually going to help with collaboration, as I said before. And to end, we'll do a bit of a play between David and myself, where we show how life is before and after incorporating Proton into your workflows. So let's get started with why Proton. We launched Proton in preview last year at reInvent, and we went GA just in July of this year. So it's, a, it's an early service. We're still growing. We're still learning a lot from customer, and there is a lot we want to do with it. So we thought it was a good idea to sort of go back to why did we do this? Why did we launch this service? What do we expect that customers will get out of it? And to do that, let's think about the end process, the end result of the development process. Why are we doing all of this? Well, we want to build applications. We want to deliver those. And we want those applications to work. What does work mean? Work means that they have to, for sure, solve a customer problem, meet the need that drove the creation of said application. They have to function with no bugs or maybe a few, as few as possible, but definitely makes us feel confident that it's doing what it should be doing. Uh, we want to be performant, meaning we want to make sure that it's not slow, doesn't leave customers waiting, or it doesn't force other components on our value chain to wait. And we want it to be secure. This is obviously critical. We are always going to be looking to make sure that our applications are meeting our standards of security, that our data is safe, our customers' data is safe, and there are a lot of steps that we oftentimes have to take to make sure that happens. And finally, we want to make sure that it makes efficient use of our resources. The promise of the cloud is that you pay for what you need and you are not overpaying for idle resources. Well, it's part on us to make sure that we are provisioning things right, we're using the right type of infrastructure for the workloads that we're going to be running. So if this is true across the company. We have oftentimes a division of labor between different teams. And the reason is that we want people to be able to focus on one particular component to drive to this greater good. A very simple distinction in this case is between development and platform teams. So let's think about development teams. Why am I, what am I worried about as a developer? It's, it's clear, right? I want to make sure that my application does what it should do. I have a customer problem that I need to solve. I have a user story that I need to complete. Is that happening? Do I have any major bugs? I'm going to put my application through a series of tests. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to have people use it. I'm going to run some automated tests. And if something is not working, I will want to fix it. And finally, is it running smoothly? When I build an application, I have an expectation of how it should behave. How quickly should it answer? How long should it take to do certain things? And so I want to make sure that while I'm actually deploying, meets those standards. A slower might compromise the whole system, and that could be a problem. The other side of the coin is the platform team. The platform team is more trying to look at the underlying infrastructure. So they are going to be worried about things like, are we meeting our standards of cost and security? I've set forth a series of criteria for how things should be handled, how we want to make sure that all of the data is properly protected, how we're making sure that we are not over-provisioning, and I want to make sure that all of our applications are meeting that standard. Do I have any dependency that I need to worry about? Perhaps there is an unmanaged risk there, and I want to make sure I cover it. And finally, is this thing up to date? This is something that we're going to be talking a lot about often today, and I'm definitely going to be harping back on it a lot. But the idea is that my standards, my def the definition of what I want to do today might change over time. And I want to make sure that infrastructure keeps updated with my standards. So I don't feel like everything that happened before today is problematic in that sense. So those teams need to work together. And they have different goals that contribute to the greater good, if you want. But they need to find a space for that collaboration. How do they work together to ensure that they both get what they need? There are a lot of tools for application delivery. 
that serve part of that purpose today. And we mentioned some of them on the slide. Infrastructure as code tools. So you can think about AWS Cloud Formation or Terraform that allow you to define your application in a way that is repeatable and is easy to track and you can share with others. You have pipelines, CICD pipelines, that will help you with creating a standard process by which your code gets built and then tested and then properly deployed. And ensuring that you have a good pipeline will allow you to ship faster and with more confidence. And for sure, we have observability tools, the other pillar of modern application development, all about making sure that we know what's going on with our applications. If there is a problem, if they are not working like they should, we want to know, we hopefully want to know before our customers even know, so we can quickly address the problem and not affect them. So it's great. It's great that we have these tools. It's great that we have these mechanisms to ensure that all of those pieces are put together. But not everything is solved. One of the problems that we have, and at least three of them here, is well, how do I sure that how do I make sure that my developers are using these tools as specified? I can spend a bunch of time creating standards or templates for my infrastructure and for my pipelines, but then I want to make sure that they are used by my teams in the process of actually delivering their applications. And so I need a mechanism to go out and say, what's in use? Is it what I expected it to be? Has it changed in any way? The second piece of the puzzle is about developers. As a developer, it's great that I can do all of this. But I showed before how my concern is about making sure that my application is working. Not about having to chase a bunch of different standards, deploy it multiple times, and connect all of the pieces together to make my application work. So how can I speed up the process? As a developer, how can I go from code to a, deploy, to a deployed application quickly? We'll see a bit of this story in our little play later, but it's definitely something that we want to help developers with. And the last piece of the puzzle, and as I said, I will keep insisting on this, is how do we keep this updated? Standards are a snapshot in, a snapshot in time. I am going to say this is what we need our infrastructure to be today. I'm going to share it with people. But over time, things change. Our company change, the standards evolve, new features are released, and we want to make sure that what we have is meeting that. So how do we ensure that my application stays true to what we need it to be now and in the future? Well, our answer to that question is AWS Proton. AWS Proton sits in the middle of those platform teams and development teams, and we want it to be that space for collaboration where both teams can go to have their needs their, met, their needs met in a way that uh, satisfies the needs of both, of both sides. Um, a customer told me once that one of the things he really likes about Proton is that it helps this team work together, whether there is good communications between them or not. And I think that's part of the piece of the puzzle here. You don't want to have to rely on external factors. So how is it done in a nutshell? Well, as a platform team, you're going to go to AWS Proton and you're going to tell us what your standards are. This is my infrastructure that I want to use. These are the pipeline tools. And this is how the pipelines are configured. This is my observability. As a developer, you're going to go to Proton and say, I have my code. I want to make a deployment. And what Proton will do is work with those tools that we mentioned before, the infrastructure as code, the pipeline, or the observability tools to make sure that everything is happening as it should. Because Proton is sitting in the middle of this process, it allows both sides to get what they need. It allows the platform teams to know exactly what, what is in use and to keep things updated over time. So it becomes that hub that allows us to work together in that sense. So let's think back about the three problems that I said before and explore how Proton can help me with them. Three key features or three key benefits that we want to talk about. The first one is self-service access to templates. So one of the things I, I say often is that templates oftentimes get a bad rep because, well, are they limiting? They aren't. They are a tool for somebody to create those standards that we'll feel comfortable with. I just need a good way to access them and to configure them to my own. Uh, in Proton, you get that as a developer. And even more, as a platform team, you get the capacity to observe how those templates are being used, by whom, and evolve them over time. The second piece of the puzzle, as I mentioned before, was helping developers do all of this in one single interface. Well, that's Proton. In Proton, you can show up, your code is in your repo, and Proton will take care of procuring all of the pieces that you need to get your service from your repo to the different stages in your pipeline to production. One interface, you can come in, do your thing, and then go back to working and improving the code. 
And finally, it's a tool to keep infrastructure updated. So because, well, like I said, Proton is sitting in the middle of that process, platform teams can always go back to Proton, see if something has changed, see if their existing deployments are need to be evolved in any way, and Proton will help them move things forward. So in that sense, we are orchestrating all of those tools together to make sure that developers have a smooth, streamlined experience and platform teams have the capacity to manage things that they are looking for. So this is a bit high level. Let's talk a little about the customer use cases. We have three use cases that we're going to be talking about today that uh, represent slightly different problems that customers can be facing and having working on using Proton. The first one is about keeping infrastructure updated. So this customer is a small, uh, relatively small startup in, in the US in the financial field. It has a very small platform team, literally just one person. They are moving very fast though. They are oftentimes changing things and trying new stuff and updating how they configure their infrastructure. And so this team was using a lot of broad API calls and cloud formation itself to update their infrastructure, create new ACS cluster and new CS tasks. And it was starting to become a struggle for this one person team to stay on top of everything. Teams were moving fast, they were deploying new things, the platform team itself was trying new stuff and keeping everything updated, and it was becoming a problem to make sure that all the deployments stayed up to date. There was a wide proliferation of infrastructure. So along comes Proton, and this team is able to create templates in Proton that team can, teams can use over and over to deploy their stuff. Now developers go to Proton to get their application deployed, and the platform team itself goes to Proton to push updates. Through this central tool, we can now see all of my services in their stages. I can see if they are updated or not, and I can be confident that they are carrying along as I move. This customer has several of their te Proton templates in versions 10, 15, because they are embracing that idea of changing things fast and moving forward. The second use case is about helping developers. This is a customer in Japan. It's a slightly larger platform team. They have three people. But the platform team was sort of struggling with a similar problem, which is they were not, they didn't have the capacity to support all their development teams. They were working with a large group of developers who were maybe not experts in cloud infrastructure and cloud formation and a small subset that knew well what they were doing. This team found itself having to often hire contractors or additional help to assist some of the teams because as they were growing very fast, they didn't have a mechanism to keep things in check. With Proton, they've been able to create templates they can share with all of those teams. They multiply the value of what they do. They can assist many more teams at the same time. And they are also working to make sure that the developers that have good knowledge of cloud infrastructure and that are able to work well with cloud formation, they have exposure to the underlying infrastructure itself and they can comment, make changes and suggest. David will talk you through one of the key features that we're announcing today that is actually going to be super beneficial to this customer because it will empower that collaboration one level further. And then the final use case is about moving workloads to the cloud. So the, the customer here is a large financial institution. They have a lot of development teams that have been working on-premise, oftentimes in monolithic applications, and they are ready to move to containers on AWS. And they want to provide those developers in their teams with the capacity to move their workloads in a way that is self-managed, that doesn't require a lot of attention from the platform team, but that allows them to benefit from everything the cloud has to offer. They've put together a actually very smart set of templates that are broken down into multiple layers. And so each development team is able to go to Proton, get one of those templates, and start migrating their application. And they work on it layer by layer. Let me sure that the compute works, and then I move on to my networking, and then I move on to my observability. What this allows to do is that each development team can migrate to the cloud at the right pace for them, and the platform team still has one central location where they can tell where everybody is, if anybody needs help, or if any changes need to be made. So that's very exciting. This is an ongoing process, as you can imagine. So to close out, before we, we get to the fun part about the new features, I wanted to talk a little bit about how do you want to 
adopt Proton. Uh, a service like Proton requires a bit of thinking to adopt, right? You're going to be defining your infrastructure. You might have to make some changes in the way you do things. And over the past few months, as we talk to customers, we've been trying to identify what are the commonalities of the success use cases. How do you get to a good place when you don't hit too many bumps on the road? And so the most important advice that I have here is think about starting small. Uh, like I said, you have to create those templates. You have to share them with your development teams. And you want to make sure that your developers are adopting and you're making changes as you go. Pick one, two, three types of use cases. In this particular screen, we have a ton of microservices. We're just selecting two. Pick a handful of them and make sure that you drive the common infrastructure and you create templates for them and you start using those. It allows you to figure out what you want in your templates, what parameters, what level of customization. It allows you to work with those teams to figure out how does it work, what is working nice for us, what should we change. It might allow you to reach out to the Proton team and suggest some new things that you need. And once you reach a level of comfort with that first layer, you're going to move to the second one, which is expansion across your company. So now that I'm comfortable with the templates that I have, I'm going to keep looking for commonalities. And so I might expand the number of templates that I have to cover more use cases, and I might expand the number of teams that are working with Proton to serve more different teams. I'm still somewhat contained in that I'm not trying to get all of my services. As you can see on the screen, not all the microservices have migrated into Proton. There are one-off microservices, experimental changes. You don't need to rush to get them into the standard. But by allowing yourself to focus on the 70-80% of the of services that have relatively common infrastructure, you give yourself capacity to personalize the attention that the other ones get. And eventually, they can migrate into the platform. And so through that iterative process, you can reach to a level of comfort where the majority of your services are managed through Proton, you know exactly what you need, and your developers are comfortable. And then from there, you're going to keep growing. I will say that as anybody listening goes through this process, um, if there are questions or suggestions, you should feel free to reach out to us. Proton is a new service. We're learning from customers a lot as we go, and we're always looking for opportunities to figure out how to work better and how to better serve uh, the needs of our customers. So with that said, let's talk about the new features, uh, and specifically new features around the area of collaboration. I'm going to invite David to join me right now, and he's going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, Proton and Git and some of the stuff that we're putting together. Sweet! Okay. Thank you, Rafa. That was delightful, as always. Um, howdy, y'all. My name is David, and I am a senior developer on the AWS Proton team. And one of my favorite things about Proton is that at the core of it, it really is a tool about collaboration. Just like Rafa was saying earlier about helping developers and platform teams collaborate together. So I am really excited to talk to you today about a few features that we have been working on to help supercharge collaboration. Um, but before we do that, I actually want to talk a little bit about me. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what collaboration means to me. So as I mentioned a second ago, I am a developer. And as many other developers would probably agree, when you say, what do you use to collaborate? What kind of tooling do you use? Without even a single synapse firing, without even a single thought, you'll probably say Git, right? Git has been with us for years and years and years. I know at least for my entire professional career, we have used Git, except for this one kind of awkward time where we use some other SVN tool, which is fine. Um, but Git has been around forever, uh, it seems, and developers have taken it uh, into the core of almost all of their workflows. And that's, that's super awesome, and I'm super excited about that, and I love Git personally. But what excites me even more than you know, developers using Git all the time and having a great time is that Git has kind of evolved into a tool that other fields are also using, right? So at AWS, for example, our documentation teams all use Git to manage their documentation. And this works super well because there's such an overlap between sort of technical and documentation work that needs to happen. So when the tech teams or the development teams are writing new features, you know, our our documentation teams will uh, create a commit to their Git repository saying, hey, this is you know, how we understand this feature. Does this look good to you? And development teams are like, yep, this makes total sense. You're really good at writing stuff. Um, and so it works super well to collaborate even across fields. 
And this, this pattern has continued in sort of every aspect of technical life at Amazon and AWS. Our translators, our, our um, sort of configuration folks, our, our really in the weeds engineers, um, our UI folks, like everyone, no matter what their job family is, uses Git to collaborate, which is super cool. Like at this point, it just become the standard for collaboration. But you have to just kind of wonder why. What, what makes Git so special? Why has it become this tool that has become the standard for collaboration? It certainly isn't the CLI. Um, and while I love the CLI, I don't think anyone would say that the Git CLI has a delightful developer experience. It's good. It's great. And there's lots of tools out there to make it better. But there's a lot of other things that have made it become the standard for collaboration. So I just want to talk about a few of the things that I think make Git so special and such a powerful tool for collaboration. The first, ironically, isn't really a feature of Git itself, but of the Git platforms that exist out there. The GitHubs, the GitLabs, the Bitbuckets, the code commits, and that's pull requests. And pull requests are really this super simple model of being able for someone to be able to suggest a change to a repository and for the maintainer of that repository to either approve that change, to reject that change, to make comments, and just generally have discussion about this particular feature. So I think pull requests are great and you know obviously we use them every day as a developer um, building stuff, but I want to tell you a little story about pull requests that's kind of funny. Um, so a few years ago I, I was working on AWS Copilot, a delightful CLI for uh, making developing containers easy, um, and we had just launched. And you know I, I had written a lot of the documentation myself and just you know, a day after we launched, we kept seeing all of these pull requests coming into our repository. AWS Copilot is open source, so all of it is on there, um, on GitHub. So we, we were looking at all these um, pull requests coming in, and I was just very much delighted. I was like, what are they changing? Like, why are all these people, like, updating the CLI? This is great. And all, almost all of them were just pull requests fixing my spelling mistakes in our documentation. Um, and so I, I just thought that was delightful because if you think about it, you know, there's documentation out there that's really, you know, you, you know, there might be probably not a lot of folks have as many spelling issues as I do, but maybe, you know, you're, you are reading documentation, you have an idea of how to make it more clear or more interesting, or like you want to add a picture or something. And, you know, if there's this, like, this weird little feedback button in the bottom right that you fill out and it gets sent into the void, like, that's not a super great model for collaborating on documentation. But when your documentation is open source, like Copilot's is, like AWS's is, you know, you get people, people can give feedback, even if they are not documentation people, even if they're not technical people, even if it's just my mom coming online and being like, huh, David doesn't know how to spell and is like, again, ruining our family name. Um, that's not funny. I, I, she thinks it's delightful that I can't spell. But anyway, I think pull requests are really the fundamental underpinning for how Git has become such a powerful collaboration tool. That is not all. The other thing that I think is delightful and uh, helps supercharge Git as this collaboration tool is the audit history. So every time you make a change in a Git repository, um, you know, a commit is made with the person who made it with the change and a little blurb describing what the change has in it. Um, and, you know, you might say, how does that really affect collaboration? Well, I just want to give you another example. The AWS Proton team is actually a bi-coastal team. So a lot of us are on the West Coast. I'm in Seattle. My teammates are in New York. Um, and so one of my favorite experiences is waking up in the morning, you know, logging on, maybe 9 a.m. my time with a cup of coffee. And the Proton folks on the East Coast, it's noon for them. They've already been at work, you know, for a good portion of the day. I log in and I just look at the commits of all these things that some people have done, all the bugs that all of my bugs that my teammates have fixed. It's really just a delightful tool to be able to keep track of what's going on. Beyond just this audit history and pull requests, the thing that makes Git so special, in my opinion, is just the wealth of tooling that has evolved around it. I love the like creativity people have around um, building tools that are uh, integrated with Git. I mean, you have Slack bots, which would tell you that like a pull request is merged. You have all sorts of like bots or uh, uh, 
notification thingies. There's just there's like a ton of really cool things built around Git that make it a super pleasant experience. Oh, and like I was talking about the CLI earlier and how maybe it's not the best CLI in the entire world. Well, there's tons of tooling out there that provide a really good developer experience centered around Git. So these three things make Git a really pleasant and powerful tool to collaborate with. So maybe you're asking, hey, David, why is everyone not using Git for everything if it's so great? That's a really good question. Maybe they should. Um, there's this new trend in our industry that I think has so much potential and I'm really excited about called GitOps. And the idea around GitOps is that you know everything that has to do with your application runtime is uh, authored and managed in Git. So your configuration, your code, your infrastructure, you know, the list of teammates' birthdays, all of it is managed in Git, and you never have to leave your Git repository to make a change to your application infrastructure. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, Git is this powerful tool for collaboration, how it has enabled this new like, uh, way of developing software through GitOps. And so we on the Proton team were thinking like, we want to tap into this. We want to bring the power of Git to Proton. How do we do this? Well, our first, the first thing that we are doing to uh, help integrate Git into the AWS Proton uh, world is one of the new features that we're super excited about called Template Ops. And Template Ops stands for AWS Proton Templates uh, Synced from Git. And the basic idea here is that rather than authoring your uh, uh, your Proton templates, you know, in a text editor and like uploading it to S3 and hoping that it validates and then going to the Proton console to see what it is, instead you'll do uh, we'll plug into what folks are already really doing and just whenever there is a chain when someone authors their Proton templates, they put it into a Git repository, they edit it there, they use pull requests or whatever uh, tooling they have built around and treat it just like code, and when you push to that repository, Proton picks it up and registers it as a new um, template. So I know that was a lot. I'm going to go over it in more detail soon. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about life before template ops. So life before template ops, you know, you have your administrator team and your development team, and your development team has discovered this new feature. I do this a lot. I'm like, wow, this is a really neat feature. Um, and so they want to be able to use it in their templates, in the templates that they're using to deploy their software. So what do they do? Well, you know, maybe they cut a ticket in an internal ticket system. Maybe they directly email their administrator. Um, maybe if that doesn't work, maybe a few days go by and you start paying them on Slack. Or if you're like me, you just go leer at people in the office. Um, there's lots of wonderful ways to try to get people's attention, uh, but they're all kind of haphazard and all over the place. And our four developers are kind of stuck in, um, in trying to figure out how to collaborate with their administrator team. And it's not great for the administrator team either. So once they are like kind of pinged and made aware of this change, they have to find where they stored this template on their laptop. Maybe they didn't store it in a laptop. Maybe they're storing it in Git. Maybe they're not. Um, they have to actually take the change that the uh, developer suggested and validate it and incorporate it in existing templates. You know, like if you're sending it over email, who knows what your email client has done with like the code that the developer has sent or like the configuration. So it's, it's a lot of work. And then finally, our administrators have to, you know, tar, tar up that bundle. Uh, upload it to S3, go to Proton, log in, register the template, and make sure that it validates. So this is fine, but it certainly doesn't uh, supercharge collaboration. But let's take a look at life with template ops. So now we're going to go back in time, and our administrators are going to push their template to a Git repository. So rather than uploading it to S3, they're just going to store it in Git, and Git will be the source of the truth for their template. And now our development teams find out about this cool new feature. You're like, oh, I heard about this Amazon ECS feature that I wish I could use. And rather than having to like beg the administrator team to incorporate it into their template, 
Since the template is authored in Git, I mean, uh, mastered in this Git repository, they can just go to the repository itself and they can propose the change. So our development team pulls down the repository, they make the change, they probably don't have access uh, permissions to push directly to that repository, but they can push to their own branch. And at that point, they can create a pull request that our administrators can either approve, deny, or look at. So now that there's this pull request outstanding, all our administrators have to do is review it. And in this case, our administrators maybe have a few suggestions. And you can have this conversation back and forth between the development team and the admin team that doesn't involve email and Slack and all that weird stuff. And once they're happy, our admin team can just merge it in. So at this point, you don't have to worry about like weird formatting errors and Outlook or Slack or whatever. And what's really cool is now Proton comes along and hears, oh, there's a new commit to this uh, template Git repo. I should sync it. And so Proton automatically syncs this, uh, Git, uh, this new template and a new version of the template is created in Proton. So that, that that's template ops. I think it's I'm super excited to see how this opens doors for collaboration between the administrators and the development teams. So I want to change gears just a little bit and talk about another new feature that we're launching that I'm equally as excited about, and I'm sure many of you will be as well, and that is Terraform. So since the beginning of time, Proton Standard Time, i.e. last year, um, we have heard from our customers that they want to be able to write uh, architectures, Proton templates, in Terraform. And I cannot tell you the emphaticness of which the Proton team agreed. Um, I, I end up writing a lot of Terraform um, myself, so I was very excited about this. But kind of the question we had to ask ourselves was, how can we support Terraform users? You know, when we launched Proton last year, we supported CloudFormation, and I think we had a really good intuitive grasp on what CloudFormation customers wanted, right? Like, we know that CloudFormation customers, we know kind of the pain that they have with CloudFormation and what their expectations are. And so we knew what to do and help, uh, how to help CloudFormation customers. But for folks using Terraform, you know, while we were big fans of Terraform, while I love Terraform, you know, we weren't as sure like what our customers expected. So what do we do? The easiest thing in the world, we just asked you all. <laughs> so here are the kind of things we heard from our customers. We asked them how, what do you imagine Terraform support would look like in Proton? And things that we heard were, you know, I want to check the generated Terraform before it's applied. You know, Terraform is pretty readable and it's totally reasonable to want to give it a glance over to see what is going to be applied to your production stack before you apply it. it makes total sense. We'd like to run our linters on our templates before the templates are executed. You know, one of the things I love a lot about Terraform is kind of this open source ecosystem that's been built around it. Things like linters and style checkers. Like all these things are super important and our customers love them. And we want to be able to support that as well when our customers are using Terraform. And finally, like one of the things that we heard over and over again is that you know, our organization already has a deployment workflow for our Terraform templates. But we, don't, we do want to give our developers sort of an AWS Proton experience. So how do we like join those two things together? So we kind of have this, this, uh, this uh, gathering of the Proton uh, folks, the PMs, the engineers, the developers, and we're like, what can we do? Like, sure, we could just execute the Terraform ourselves. Like, that would be fine. Maybe folks would like this. Seems like a very managed experience. But the one thing that almost all of the customers that we spoke to had in common was that their Terraform uh, deployment process and management was all centered around Git. So we'd already started working on templates uh, ops, and we we're like, okay, maybe maybe there's something there. So when we were thinking, okay, what do we do? We we just kind of fell back to this idea that Git is this really powerful tool for helping folks collaborate. So could it help Proton collaborate with existing customer workflows? So. The way that our Terraform support ended up looking, uh, which I think is really cool and I'm super excited about, was that instead of um, executing the Terraform 
uh, templates uh, directly, what we do is we render Terraform templates and then we send them to our customers' predefined Terraform repositories as pull requests. So let me show you a little bit what that looks like real quick. So a developer comes along and wants to provision a new service in Proton. The developer, she doesn't care what the architecture is, I mean, uh, what the infrastructure exactly looks like. She certainly doesn't care about maybe what the infrastructure as code language is. Um, and so she just fills out her spec and is super happy and is, uh, is going about her business. Proton, at that point, takes the spec plus the template that the platform team um, or the administrator team defined and joins the two together and renders fully, uh, fully formed Terraform templates. Next, Proton looks at the Terraform repository that the platform or administrator team set up when they set up this environment or service. And then Proton sends a pull request to this Terraform repository. At this point, you know, any automated tests that you have defined, um, any custom approvals that you have that run when a pull request is sent to your repository um, get run. If, you, if the pull requests require manual approval, um, then the platform team or admin team can come along and manually approve the change. Uh, then Proton just keeps an eye on the pull request while it's still open, and once it's closed, uh, uh, the, the deployment is complete. So rather than going through uh, more demonstrations of what all this looks like, uh, Rafa and I would like you to join us on a journey uh, through the day in the life of a developer and a platform engineer. Ah, welcome back, Rafa. It is delightful to see you. How are Hi. you? I'm doing great, and I have my headphones on so we can talk. Oh, mine just appeared. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's magic. <laughs> Well, I am excited to work with you on our theatrical performance of A Day in the Life. Um, so maybe just reintroduce yourself to folks who have, uh, uh, you know, forgotten about us since the beginning of the talk. Hi, everybody. I'm again Rafa. I'm the product manager in the Proton team. I work very closely with David. Yeah, and I'm still David, the developer. But for today's performance, we'll be switching roles. So Rafa, you will be playing... I'm going to be the, ad the administrator. Yes, and I will try to stretch my thespian skills and play the developer. Um, so today's scene, if you will indulge me, is my team has developed an application. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm being kind of silly, but you know, this is this is really what most developers want to spend their time doing, right? Like we write our code. We test our code, we make sure it's super good, we containerize it, we're super happy, you know, we try to limit the size of our container. We, we do all those fun things that we love to do. But now we're faced with kind of like a challenge. Um, I want to deploy my application. So I have my code, That that is what I spend most of my time thinking about and writing. And, you know, I've heard about Amazon ECS, that seems like a natural fit for me if I want to deploy my container. But the question is, how? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I could definitely go to Stack Overflow and just like, you know, look, hey, how do I deploy a container on Amazon ECS? Like, there's lots of really good ways to do it. But, you know, Rafa is my uh, my platform team, my administrator, and I don't want to just deploy some random things. So I'm going to go ask him for maybe, uh, you know, a CloudFormation script or something that he can give me that is like totally vetted and totally good and ready to be deployed. So, uh, Rafa, do you happen to have like a service template or something that I can use to deploy my uh, container to ECS? So this is exciting. I do. Uh, I've been working on one. We have this nice template. Uh, it has all of the components that we need. It has the right infrastructure, the right controls. So this is this is the right technology to use. Uh, just go ahead, David. Sweet, Rafa. That's delightful. Thank you for saving me. All the time in the world that it would take me to write a CloudFormation template, I appreciate it. Um, just for my own edification, let's just take a look inside. And it looks like there's like a lot of words here. Um, you, you know, I think we've all, I don't know, I spend a lot of time writing CloudFormation. Um, and at some point it becomes like, a. there are parts of it that are less readable than others. So 
this isn't really a document that's meant to be read, um, so I'm just going to go ahead and try to deploy it as is. I trust Rafa. I trust him completely. So let's just deploy this thing. Of course, I need to remember that this is the template for the service, but I need more than just the service, right? I need some permissions and I need networking. And, you know, at this point, it, me and my team work really hard to build this code and like, we just want to see it running. Like, we don't want to have to like go through all the steps of like, you know, crafting a role with least privilege or, um, you know, writing uh, a VPC that is super restrictive. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a role with admin access just for now. And I'm going to create a VPC that allows all traffic from the World Wide Web in. Um, again, this is just temporary. I know like the security people will be super upset about me or whatever, but this is just temporary. I know, you know, we'll get to it later. So uh, now that I have everything working, I have my service deployed, I have my network set up, I'm gonna go uh, tell Rafa and he can tell me about how proud he is of me for all the work I've done. Rafa? So awesome. Um, I'm gonna go to CloudFormation, have a look at what David deployed. Uh, ooh, there's a lot of stuff here that I'm not quite sure of. I think his IAM roles are way too permissive. He's allowing all kinds of traffic. This seems to be deploying straight to production, maybe skipping some of our steps. Lots of things here that I am not comfortable with. Uh, um, yeah, we, we, need, we need to fix this. And so it, it's a bit too much, maybe, what's happening right now, but I definitely have questions about how this came to be, and I need a better alternative. This cannot be the way we get things deployed. I'm very quickly going to lose control over all of these changes. We're going to have to try something else. So why don't we just Proton instead? And so what I'm going to do is I am going to actually create a template for the type of work that David and his team are doing, and I'm going to put it in Proton. So I go to Proton, I say I want to create a template, and then what I'm going to do is just provide Proton with a few details about this particular template, information that will be useful for David at the time of creating the service to make sure that he knows that this is useful for him and how he can use it. And of course, because I want to work together with my team, I'm going to use template ops to make this work. So I'm going to put my template in Git. I have, this time it's a nice Terraform template. I'm going to put it in our Git repository, and I'm going to sync that with Proton. This template is now ready to use. It has the infrastructure that I want, and like, David, you can take it away. So why don't we go back to your service and you try to deploy again, but use Proton this time? Okay, I've deleted all those roles. Um, the security people have already deleted my subnet, so that was great. Um, so let's try to build something that is a uh, little more, uh, you know, well-rounded at this point. <laughs> so I'm going to go to Proton, and now, and now instead of bugging Rafa for like, you know, a template for like a request reply service, I'm actually just going to go ahead and look at all the pre-vetted templates that have been registered with Proton. So I'm trying to build a request reply service. So that means maybe there's probably a load balancer. So I'll just go to the template um, index and search load. And the very first thing that comes up is a load balanced uh, ECS Fargate service. Um, that's perfect. Couldn't be more perfect if you scripted it. Um, so I'm going to select that. And now I'm just going to fill in a few questions about my service. What is the name of my service? Where is my source code located? And finally, like, how, how do I want to configure this particular instance of my service? Um, and the, as you can see here, like, really the only things I need to fill out are the service name and sort of what environments I can deploy it to. Um, the rest of it is totally optional, but even if it wasn't, it's pretty readable. Like, Rafa has really done a great job of describing kind of the input to this service in a way that is developer-friendly and not too in the weeds of the infrastructure. So thank you, Rafa. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy this service, and, you know, great, I'm done, I'm happy. My service is deployed, and I didn't have to touch any cloud formation. And I'm happy too, because if at any point in time I want to know what's going on with David's service, it's here. I know exactly the template he used, I know the version, I can see all of the parameters that he chose, I am tightly in control of what infrastructure is in using my organization. I can see the cloud formation stack, all of the details are here. So we're in a good place. Sweet.
Well, what am I going to do with all of my free time, Rafa, now that I don't have to write infrastructure code? I'm sure you'll find something. Uh, <laughs> have no fear, Rafa. My Twitter presence is profound. Um, and so I will just spend all of my time on Twitter. Um, and so, you know, I, I do actually spend a lot of time on Twitter. So if at any point you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But, you know, in real life, like, I, I do find out a lot of really cool things that AWS does on Twitter. So in this case, for example, like, AWS blogs tweeted, new, using Amazon ECS uh, exec to access your containers on AWS Fargate or Amazon EC2. I cannot tell you how often I have littered my production code or my just like my code in general with log lines trying to help me debug an issue in like my Fargate task when just being able to like exec into it and poke around just like viewing logs, like looking at stack traces or heap dumps would be so helpful. So I really want this. I want this feature. It could be super helpful for debugging. So since Rafa uh, set up our uh, load balance web service uh, template using template ops, I know that it's in, uh, in our uh, organization's Git repo. So I'm just going to go uh, go head over there um, and add to our Terraform template the ability to enable ECS exec. Um, so this is super easy. Like I, I actually didn't have to really understand too much about the infrastructure as code. I just kind of found the part that I was interested in and was able to update it. So again, I don't have push access directly to this repository, um, but I can create a branch. I can create my own branch with this change on it and create a pull request. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a pull request asking Rafa to enable ECS exec for me. So Rafa, would you mind taking a look at that? Awesome. This is excellent. Uh, I am looking forward to reviewing this change. I do know that some other teams have been looking for a better mechanism to do some uh, debugging of the workflow. So this may be a great opportunity. Uh, let me have a look. Looks good. Just uh, uh, he, David seems to be allowing this to be used in all environments. And I'd rather we don't do this in production. So let me make a quick comment on the PR saying, hey, can you change this to only work in beta environments? Um, I sent it to David. David quickly reviews and approves because he's waiting for my every order. And we're good to go. We're going to merge this, and we're going to be in a good place here. So, so what happens now is Proton is immediately going to sync with this new version that we have in Git. And if we go back to the Proton UX, the new template version is ready to be used. It contains the stuff that David was looking for. It has been vetted by me. So both sides are satisfied. And from now on, any new development team that is looking to deploy their application is going to be, to be able to use this version. But not only that, anybody that in, ex in one of our existing teams that is being used in this application is also going to be able to get it. Proton will help me identify everybody that is not in the latest version. Like you can see on the slide, it will call out in, in blue that the version of the template in use is not the latest one, and it will help us push forward. And through that mechanism, maybe and I have basically managed to work together to bring a new feature to the table uh, and expose it to everybody so that we can all benefit from it. And that's how we continue to evolve our infrastructure uh, in a collaborative manner. Yeah, and not a single email sent. That's pretty rad. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so, so that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for indulging when David and, David and I did a bit of acting <laughs> and prove to everybody why this is not our calling. Uh, what next? <laughs> there are uh, a handful of things to talk about. Uh, our roadmap is public. It's in GitHub. So please feel free to visit it. Uh, we've been very happy with how the community has been asking for features there. They have been engaging us. Uh, we have meetings with people that are having, wondering how some things work. Uh, and we have a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, David meant it when he said that we believe that Git is the future for this collaboration. So we have lots of additional Git features that we're going to be working on. We have new ways to make deployments, new types of tools to work with. I'm sure somebody's thinking when they are going to support CDK. CDK is definitely in the roadmap and it's high in our priority list. Uh, so please feel free to come and tell us uh, what you're looking for. Uh, also feel free to, of course, try the service. We have a GitHub repository with some, some sample templates 
they are useful to see how it works, how they are constructed. And you can immediately also deploy them and start to use them. They are well vetted templates. So they might be useful for you to start thinking about what's your process. And finally, uh, start going on with your uh, proof of concept. Uh, in, earlier in my part, I said that as you worked on this, the, the Proton team was uh, ready to listen. We in AWS, we pride ourselves in being customer-centric and working with customers as much as we can. Uh, and we are no different in that sense. We are really looking forward to feedback and comments on how we can make the service better. And that's all for today. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, you have our Twitter handles there. We are both trying to act, be active on Twitter while we do our day jobs. So we're also happy to discuss Proton infrastructure or development experience in there. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>